happens. You know, I had a complete failure. I had a meeting today and it overran. And I kept thinking to myself, I'm sure I've got something, but it wasn't in my life. I'm so sorry. That's okay. And, right. Well, we're, we're here now anyway. How are you? Hi, I'm doing really well. How are you this morning? How, was thing, how are things in London today? You're in London today. No, I said, how are things in London today? Oh, oh, I see. You just disappeared for a moment. No, I'm not in London. I'm in Leeds. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so are things in Leeds? <laughs> things are okay. I mean, the weather has been quite nice. We are experiencing something like a summer, which is good. So that's always, uh, that's always good stuff. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. And, and whereabouts are you again? You're near... So I'm in. I'm actually very close to Niagara Falls, Ontario. So I'm in uh, uh, St. Catharines, which is is wine country, basically in Niagara. So uh, yes, yeah. I got to, I got to go for a nice run through the vineyards this morning. That's that's what I do for fun every day. <laughs> oh, that sounds lovely. Yes, that sounds really nice. I've not been to that part of Canada before. We went um, a number of years ago to um, Vancouver Island mm -hmm. and that way, and then to um, British Columbia, sort of like where the, the parks are. Yep. Sort of that area. So that's as far as we got. But well, um, So you flew right over us. <laughs> you bypassed yes, us. <laughs> probably, probably. I mean, I'm just south of Toronto uh, for, for another landmark. But um, yeah, no. Well, thank you for connecting today. I mean, um, what the reason why I reached out in the first place was because you were a speaker at um, uh, the, the Learning Technology Summit. And, yes. I, you know, I love a couple of things. One, when I read your profile... Um, I read that you just wrote a book, How Not to Waste Your Time on Training, which I thought was really great. Uh, and I think that just got released. But also... Yes, it has. But I also, have a copy somewhere. Yeah, no, feel free to share the copy. Um, but I also read in your bio that uh, what you enjoy most is helping people get better at learning to improve performance. And yes, yeah. I'm all about inspiring people to learn and grow. So I just thought this would be a nice connection to make. I thought maybe you could tell me a little bit about what you do. Um, I create daily content for HR managers around the globe on LinkedIn. So yeah. I thought, you know, we could have a quick discussion and, and maybe that might be a good vehicle to sort of cross promote both of us to our audiences. Yeah. Add value. yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, my uh, company, which is a small consultancy is called how to accelerate learning. And um, so I've, long been about sort of helping people to learn better um, but it's always been with that thought that I want it to be um, to improve performance not just not just to be more attractive or more engaging just for the sake of it but to have a business person purpose and my background um, I was an engineer many years ago um, has always been that um, my thinking has been you start off by thinking about what it is you want to get out of something um, quite precisely you know in engineering terms that would be down to the micron you know um, so so yeah so I've approached learning development in much the same way um, I was drawn to accelerated learning because it seemed to um, it seemed to be quite akin to what I was doing anyway, sort of that experiential type learning, um, that sort of like involving people rather than standing up and presenting. Um, and I found that, you know, from my days as an IT trainer many, many uh, years ago for IBM, where I used to stand and talk at people for, for, at length, and, and I thought I was pretty good at it. Um, but I've sort of like learned that actually the more you involve people, um, the more that they are engaged, um, then the, the deeper that learning and the more meaning it has for them as well. Um, and as a result of, of looking at accelerated learning quite deeply, um, I sort of got a bit frustrated and came up with my own five secrets of accelerated learning. And the first one I think you'll like, which is business focused and learner centered objectives. And the business focused has to be there. So it has to be centered on, you know, um, what the, what the business really needs, because if you do something just that the learners need, um, then you may not get the buy-in from the stakeholders. Um, and it has to be learner-centered as well. That has to be a balance because if you only do what the organization wants you, if it's sort of like a compliance thing or whatever, and the learners are, then they'll not really be engaged and behavioral change won't happen there. So there has to be this balance between business focus um, and learner-centered. So 
we help um, facilitators, trainers, um, subject matter experts, line managers to understand more about the learning process, to understand you know, how best we learn, but also that training isn't the sticking plaster that you apply to every single problem. That, that, that's around you know there are other options and if you really um, if you really dig deep into the organization and what it needs then you will get that business focused and that that learner centering as well does that tell you what you need to know yeah no it does and I think um, what was really interesting there I, I often say um, in order to help people learn and grow three things have to happen they have to have a vision they have to develop daily habits that serve the identity that they want to achieve or be. And when you talk about you know, the business outcome, you talk about the learners being learner centric, those two things speak to, you know, we have to be on the same page. We have to be, um, have, be aligned in our visions so that we're all headed in the same direction. Because I think part of what I, part of what I've noticed is that, you know, management can talk about learning and leadership all they want. If employees aren't in the headspace, the mindset to learn, it's a waste of it's a waste of time Absolutely. and energy. You have yeah. to prime the learner, and you yeah. prime the learner by engaging them. You engage them by helping them feel like they're making a contribution, and yeah. you know help them help them see how their vision of their future is coming true through the um, uh, the, the worthwhile work that they do every day. And Absolutely, it's, not, it's yeah. not hard for managers to do that, but we seem very disconnected as managers because. You know, we have to pay attention to the numbers and the business and everything gets so complicated. And, and I was part of a discussion this morning where it was so data centric. And I thought the average employee doesn't care about that. No, they just want to feel valued. And if they yes. feel valued yeah. and that they're making a contribution, yes. perhaps it's worth staying here. And I see my future here and I'll keep training and I'll keep. Yeah. Training. And I think data is becoming um, one of these things, even though I've written a book, which is, uh, you know, a lot about data and that um, people are seeing this as the new panacea to, you know, solving all our woes as well, which really isn't going to happen. And um, in the book, um, I, I talk about sort of that whole process of getting close to the business, you know, um, finding the right stakeholders to work with, you know, doing a, a stakeholder analysis. So find out who you really value evangelists are and work with them uh, try and convert the snipers you know that would you know um, rubbish what you do and perhaps you know put, put obstacles in the way um, stop working with the the undead you know that have no value whatsoever you know to the organization or to you as well um, and so the, the book actually takes everyone through a process of sort of aligning to the organization and also, it does talk about using your gut feeling as well, that it isn't just all about data, 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 because um, an example I shared last week when I was speaking was that um, in my time as an engineer, uh, one of the jobs I had was um, as a meteorologist, and it sounds a fancy title, but I actually would analyze wind data, that's what my job was, and um, cite wind turbines in appropriate places. And I got quite good at it and got quite, um, developed quite a gut instinct so that I could look at a map and I could look at this area that, that the proposed wind turbines were going to be sighted on and, and have some clue as to, well, this would be a good spot or that would be a good spot or that wouldn't be such a good spot. But I wouldn't have dared actually have sighted one without a site visit to, mm -hmm. to make sure that the map was telling me what indeed I thought was there because a building might have been erected in the wrong place or there might have been a whole bunch of trees that weren't on the map or whatever and I certainly wouldn't have done anything without collecting some data you know to, sh to show whether or not the, the wind speeds were in fact going to be worthwhile um, and then, you know, another thing that I used to do was um, to correlate with a nearby Met station to see what over a year or two years the average wind speeds would be as well and see how close the correlation was. So what, what the gut instinct allowed me to do was to narrow my field of search so that I knew where to collect the data from rather than collecting a whole bunch of data and being inundated by it. My gut instinct and my experience were there to sort of inform me 
and also I talked about the fact that sometimes in um, you know in collecting data you sort of feed your own bias as well you know if you for instance um, if you are very pro face-to-face -face learning and you are looking to find figures which um, compare how much learning goes on with face-to-face -face and online and it's sort of it's sort of going towards face-to-face you're going to sort of like push it along there, but you've got to be aware of those biases. You've got to, you know, you've got to look at how you're interpreting the data and make sure you're not int introducing your own biases. So the data bit, I'm very, I'm very keen on, but I'm very keen on people also not losing, losing that, that gut instinct. Cause I know that the times in my career when I've ignored my gut instinct, something bad's happened. <laughs> it's been like, why didn't I, you know, there's something gnawing at me. And I say, no, but it looks good. It sounds good. And so what's my problem? And then I've gone ahead and it's like, no, I should have actually listened to that little voice, you know? So it's, yeah, it's funny because there's very little research out there that ever gets published that disproves what somebody set out to prove in the first place. So the information <laughs> technically is biased to start with, and then you put your own biases on top yes. of that. You know, yeah. I think yeah. over history, the only time somebody was really excited about um, coming to the wrong conclusion with their hypothesis and publishing the research is when they discovered penicillin. Yes. <laughs> it turned yeah. out we made a mistake over here, but hey, look what we found, you know, yes. that doesn't normally happen, you know. No, no, that, that is the exception rather than the rule. So, <laughs> so yeah, I've got, I've got a quite a pragmatic approach, I think, to, to most things. I think the engineering always has stayed with me that the, the approach, it's always been a very practical approach that I've had. Um, and, but also um, human centered you know i think yeah. you know in terms of um i moved out of it training and moved out of engineering because i wanted to work with people more rather than you know software or stuff you know lumps of metal or whatever it's you know that's what really excites me and i suppose i'm a bit unusual in that i like science and data and people as well you know but that's um, okay. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, I've, 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 I've grown accustomed to it and, um, you know, got over that one. So that's fine. But I think that that's the thing. People think that if they go for data, they've got to, they've got to put their analytical hats on and they've got to, you know, follow it slavishly. But I took people through an example, actually, which was very useful. And it, and again, it's in the book and it's, um, it's a very simple, um, example. In fact, do you want me to show you a picture of it? Absolutely. If, if you just bear with me a sec. So here's the book. How not to waste, okay, yep. <laughs> How not to waste your money on training. And so where, I've where, got- Where can people find the book? It's on my website at the moment. Um, I have put is. it up. It's <laughs> www.howtoaccelerate-learning forward slash book. So they can go straight there. Excellent. Um, to find that, yes. Well, so, while, while you're looking that up, one of the interesting things you mentioned from your engineering background is, is starting with the end in mind and, and re -engineering. Oh, yes. And, and that's funny because that's, that's when I talk about having a vision, most companies think, oh, we've got a vision, we've got, we've got a mission, we've got goals. And we're like, that's nice, but that's not a vision. A vision is what is yeah. the outcome? What can I see in my mind's eye? If you're going to build a bridge, what does the bridge look like? What does London Bridge look like in my mind? Okay, now we're going to set out to re-engineer this thing and build it. Well, Absolutely. For some reason, companies can't seem to grasp that. <laughs> they can't grasp that concept. And they go, our vision is to have the best workplace ever. Well, that's not a vision. That's just no, uh, no. a goal. <laughs> you know, uh, but, that, but that vision is something that's, that's so important. And when you, you mentioned something else about the undead, um, I like the term uh, actively disengaged. But the thing is, you said, you know, cut the dead wood or cut the uh, undead out. Is it... I don't think it's necessary all, or I don't think it's absolutely necessary to always cut out those people who are actively disengaged or the undead. I think they just need to get realigned back into the vision as to why they're there and, and feel like they're making a contribution. Somebody, yeah. yeah, somebody once recently said, people don't, um, don't strive every day to make a difference they strive every day to make a contribution. I think that that's huge, especially for millennials. Everybody thinks millennials want to make a difference in the world. No, they just want to feel like they're making a contribution, right? Yeah. They want to feel grown up, but they're, they're part of what's going on. So when I, when I spoke about the, the, um, the stakeholders, the, have you come across the stakeholder analysis grid where 
You've no, got, I have not. So on the one axis, you've got um, the impact they've got on the organization. On the other axis, you've got um, how they support you. And so the undead are those people who have no impact in the organization and neither do they support you. And I use it um, as a tool with groups of, of people because quite often you spend a lot of time firefighting with some of these undead because they'll be the people who are on the phone complaining about something and you do whatever you can to get rid of them. So you are taken up with them. But when you actually think about it, they don't really have much impact in the organization and neither are they supporting you, but there are people who are having an impact and they are supporting you. So it's not about necessarily cutting them out completely. It's about where you focus your time on. So if you find that you've got a whole load of people who are demanding of your time, then you know who have you got to spend the most time with? And those people have got most impact in the organization and give you the most support. Those people are gonna be your cheerleaders. They are also gonna be those people who are gonna convert those people who don't support you but have got a lot of impact in the organization. So they could convert those snipers, you know, because there are sometimes, you know, there's just one person who every time there's a project seems to be a blocker. And so you can use those evangelists, those ones that are really supportive and have got, have got, got impact to actually convert those snipers. And then there are people who don't have much impact in the organization, but are great cheer, cheerleaders for you. And those are the people that will keep you going when times are tough, you know, and you just need a bit of a pep talk. They will be supporting you. And so, again, you spend some time. And it's about apportioning your time. And, and so that, that was mostly about it. And every so often you should review your stakeholders because they may have shifted. So somebody who was... Uh, an evangelist and had loads of impact maybe something's changed in the organization so they have lost some of their impact maybe one of your snipers has started to see the value of what you do and so you know they're coming on board and so you know you need to work a little bit more with them so that that's why i was talking about sort of these undead in in that particular way but just going back to your, to the example that I had. Um, I had a, a, a very simple table um, and it was five people and it was a scoring grid. It had six different competencies and I had um, a sheet and it just said, what do you see first of all on the table? Um, and you know, you could spot the highs and the lows and, and what have you. But then I showed people, you know, a graph, something like that and then got them to have a really good look at them. What's it saying to you? What does the data say? You know, without doing any analysis whatsoever, no maths involved or anything, what is that saying to you at the moment? And so from the graph, people could say, well, actually, Tracy looks like she's a good all-rounder. You know, Sheila's great, but she's not very good at working on her own initiative. And they started to then sort of say, I wonder why she's not good at working on her own initiative, you know, because she's good at everything else. And then I suggested to the group, I said, well, is that important in the job? Could be because sometimes the data raises more questions than it answers, but it's, it's knowing when to stop and what data to gather as well. And so another um, graph that I showed people was like this spider diagram. Um, and again, you don't need to see all the detail in it, but again, it's a completely different way of seeing the same data. And again, it shows the data in a slightly different way. And all you would need to do is to put the data into an Excel spreadsheet and to just click on the different types of graphs. And with each different type of graph, you would see a different part of the story emerging. And so it was, it was encouraging people to be a bit more playful with data and not to be as scared of it as having to be some sort of data analyst or mathematician or whatever. It's about where are the highs and lows, you know, even in the table, you could do the, you know, the red, amber, green thing. You could highlight everything that, that's um, a no-no. You could, you could put amber in something that looks a bit not quite suspect, you know, a bit suspect and then green for anything that's absolutely fine. And then you start to see the hot spots of where people are not quite achieving what they need to achieve. And so the whole thing was, I, I suppose, my, my aim for that, that short talk was um, to, ha to help people get over this barrier of like, first of all, you have to collect loads of data, loads and loads. It's about using that gut instinct. It's about using, so first of all, where do we start? But then when you have the data, what do you do with it? And how do you find the story? How do you get the story emerging as well? And also there was an example that we looked at of different ways 
that we could collect data as well. And I sort of took it, took it right back to basics because um, I sometimes assume that people know some of these really um, really easy phrases that, that are bandied around like qualitative and quantitative data. And actually I'm surprised when people sort of, you know, aren't absolutely sure about which is which and how do you collect it and what do you collect most of and when do you collect it? And so I went through that and we did some examples, but then I had a very simple example. It was about a company with 3000 employees and um, sales figures are down this month on predicted sales. What would you do? You know, in terms of finding out what's going wrong, what would you do? And um, one of the guys in the room came up with a very interesting observation. He said, well, the first thing I'd do is see if it's something externally in the market that's happening that's caused this. Because you could, get, go, you could go down a blind alley and think, oh, my goodness, they're not, they're not up to the sales and, you know, roll out some sales training or whatever. But actually, it could be something in the market. So that was a great start, you know, with people sort of thinking – big picture. The next part um, wasn't quite as impressive because he started to go on about all the other things that he could do. He says, well, we could do interviews and questionnaires and focus groups and blah, 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 and all of these things that they could do. And I said, let me just stop you for a minute. There are 3,000 people. How are you going to know who to interview? You know, how are you going to know? Because that's sort of like, and when you interview, you get a lot of qualitative data. You get a lot of opinions and a lot of um, feelings, you know, and a lot of sentences. And sentences aren't easy to, sure. you know, correlate together and, you know, say, well, this group think that, dot, 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 you know. And so I said, so you would start with something that generates some numbers, you know. Maybe you look at the management information that's out there to find out where the areas are, first of all, that are, are, are worst performing, perhaps, you know? And so you, you start there. And then you start to see if it's a team, if it's a product, if it's an individual or a group of individuals, you start to narrow down. And once you've narrowed down, using the quantitative stuff, that's when the qualitative stuff comes in handy. So I don't assume always that people know how to use that. I think because maths was always very natural for me, I was a, a real maths geek and I used to do sums for fun, you know, just, 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 just because I could, just for fun I used to do them. So, um, so I don't assume that. So I think people got a lot out of it in that, you know, they, they took away from that um, the fact that you have to have the relevant data you also have to decide what sort of data you're going after as well. And these days, actually, when, um, I don't know, about three or four years ago, any sort of feelings, any qualitative data was actually quite hard to analyze. You know, people were doing things like word clouds and stuff like that. But um, SurveyMonkey does, there's an option to do a sentiment analysis and it does some word analysis. Excel will do some analysis as well. So you've got specific words that keep cropping up. You can do a search on that. And so there is much more. Um, and there are actually now companies that I've spoken to that have got bolt-ons to some of their data management systems, which are akin to sort of like artificial intelligence, which is helping them to analyze some of the qualitative stuff that would have been years ago quite difficult um, to analyze as well. So... So it's really interesting how um, how, how you've put in, how you've put uh, analysis and data into this whole new perspective, which I think is really important. I mean, I think you've shared a lot of really good uh, insights into how to rethink how we use data, which I think is huge. But um, let me go back to your the original statement of you want to help people get better at learning to improve performance. How what if you could share one message with HR managers? What would that one idea, that one message be? How are you going to help? Um, how are you going to help people get better at learning? If you have identified what the real issue is, if you have really um, got to the bottom of it, rather than what people want, you've found out what people need. Um, then I think it makes it so much easier to provide the right learning solution. Quite often, people will say, "We need dot dot dot." And actually, when you start digging, um, you find out that actually it's not, that's what they want, but actually what they need is something else. And I can give you an example in this. Um, I was asked to um, 
come into an organization, it was a tech company, not far from here, and um, somebody recommended me, it was a team leader development program, and there was a whole shopping list full of stuff, and I just asked lots of questions about why they, why this team, why now, uh, one of the, the really weird answers was that, uh, well, the senior team had had some training and they thought it'd be nice for the team leaders to have some as well. Um, I asked lots and lots of questions about why they needed conflict management, why they needed problem solving, what was going on, why was the business suffering as a result of it, what would they like to see differently? And a lot of the answers were coming back, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And when I did a detailed analysis for them, they didn't need half of the stuff. And so... You know, this is why the book has been called How Not to Waste Your Money on Training, because if you haven't correctly identified the need, then it doesn't matter what you do, it doesn't matter how engaging it is, it doesn't matter how colourful it is, it doesn't matter what bells and whistles you put on it, if it's not actually going to meet a need and help people to work better, and you were saying, you know, people want to uh, make a contribution, if they're not going to be able to make a better contribution, so if it's not learner-centred and if it's not business-focused, then really you're wasting your time quite frankly because you know it's just a grand day out you know and it is, is. not that that's very well said um, and when you when you talk about doing those analysis are you talking do you think businesses should should break it down to uh, one-on-one -on -one analysis or, or one to many because I think a lot of companies will just throw out a survey and and, and Simon Sinek um, if you're familiar with him uh, yeah. has a really good message he says you know as parents we would never send an email to our kids with a survey saying, how are we doing as parents? How can we help you? You know, you don't do that. You sit down with them on the other on the edge of their bed at night and you say, hey, you know, how's it going? How can I help? What's going on? And it's that one-to-one -one connection that I think is lost. I think it's the human connection that um, a lot of leaders and managers seem to struggle with the ability to sit down with their good performers or bad performers and, and everybody in between and, and just have real human conversations with them to find out what they need. I, I think you're absolutely, you're, on, you're absolutely on the money there because I think um, line managers, they are, you know, the day-to-day -day contact, you know, with those individual learners or performers, whatever you want to call them, colleagues, whatever. I tend to offend somebody by calling somebody whatever. So I think the line manager that are those people who should have their finger on the pulse, as it were. And, um, but I think there is a place um, for getting those numbers, but the qualitative stuff, you know, you can have those in conversations with line managers. Um, if that isn't working because the line manager relationship isn't a good one, then, you know, <clears throat> there is room then for other ways. It could be a focus group or it could be an interview, you know, with somebody from learning development. So it's, it's about sort of being open to, um, look, where is the problem? Finding out, you know, there's got to be some flags somewhere that, that are waving. So this is where the problem is roughly. And then you start digging a little bit deeper. So again, going back to this, this group that I was um, working for, I end up doing this team leader development program. There was, um, I spent um, a half day with the senior team to find out what they thought of this group of team leaders. And they spent a lot of time moaning about them. And then we sort of looked at, well, what would you like them to be? How would you like them to be? And we did sort of, we used a profiling tool. And, um, and then they sort of graded them. So I knew who was at the top of the pile and I knew who was roughly at the bottom of the pile as well. You know, actual names of people. I then sent a survey out to the team leaders and I sort of had a bit of a hunch you know when you sort of like think I wonder what's going on with this relationship because it just sounds there's something not not quite right and I put a question in there which was real sort of like I'm just taking a punt here and it was how much time do you spend with your senior manager is it just enough too much or too little and it was just that. And then I got them to score themselves according to the competencies that the senior team found important. And they had to score themselves out of 10. So then I got a sense of who was at the top and who was at the bottom according to the team leaders. So I had these two lists almost. And miraculously, some of the people at the bottom of the list with the senior managers appeared as if miraculously at the top of their own list, you know, self-scoring. And again, that opened up some other questions, you know, well, why don't they know that they're not good at doing this? Um, and if they, if they know, why aren't they being honest? 
What's, what's interesting, and, and I think in the story you're telling right now, we, we don't often, we, we promote, companies tend to promote high performance. Think, think of sales. If you're really yeah. good at sales, they think, okay, if we make you the sales manager, then everybody else will learn from you. But that yes. person who was really good at what they were doing doesn't necessarily make them a really good communicator. And what's really interesting as a parent, I've learned this lesson um, with my own kids. One of our, one of our friends is a, good, he's a well-known psychologist. And, and I said to him, I said, why is it that as somebody as, as sort of accomplished as I am in, in health and wellness, in sport, um, do I find that both my kids who are more talented than I am are pushing away right now in their early adult years and, and, and not sort of getting the years of benefit of, of the, the mistakes that I made? And, yes. and they said, Dave, the problem is that you maybe as a high performer, you've set the bar so high that they feel like they can't keep up, they can't compete. And I think that was a really interesting thought yeah. because yes. think we think of us, think of a sales manager. If you're a superstar sales manager or a superstar salesman, you get promoted or a salesperson, you get promoted to be the manager of sales and you can't understand why everybody else can't do what you did. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. all this, you're not a good communicator. You're just, you're just, you're just good at your job. You're just do what I tell you. You know? Yeah. And I think, and that's the other thing that I found out from this group of people was the ones that were considered the best team leaders had actually been recruited from outside and they had nothing to do with the technology that actually the, the company was developing. They weren't experts at all in this technology. They had some understanding of it, but they weren't experts, not like the other people. These were real techies and they were struggling to, to motivate and to also delegate and to actually share their knowledge with their teams as well. So it, it, it's, it sounds simplistic, but you know, I think if you get the right objectives, if you find the, the actual need that, that people have, and line managers are having those conversations, and I, and I go to so many companies where they're not, you know, I, I think it would be a lot better because you'd have a lot more of that qualitative data, you'd have the anecdotal stuff that would point you in the right direction. The line managers would have that gut instinct about what's going wrong. And then, you know, you and L&D, you know, if, if they were still struggling, you could then help them to, to uncover that, you know, maybe it did need a survey or whatever, but I don't know, maybe I'm oversimplifying it or whatever, but it just seems straightforward to yeah. me. But there seems to be lots of barriers to it to actually happening. You know, I agree 100%. I don't understand. It does seem very simple to me as well, and I don't understand what all the challenges are um, or, or why we face them. But I did, I did read something the other day um, where somebody said, we need to stop calling communication a soft skill. It's indeed one of the most essential business skills that we yes. have. It is as highly yeah. important as uh, you know, math might be to an engineer, well, to any business, if you can't communicate well, that's a core business skill. You won't be in business very long. You won't be able to leave yeah, very long. Absolutely. So I just, you know, it's a, it's a mindset shift. And, and yeah. you know, unfor well, fortunately, I think, I think a lot of the solutions that, that many businesses face is just mindset and being yeah. able to keep on the, on the same page. And, yes. But and I, I, yeah, sorry. And I, no, it's fine. Yeah, communication, definitely, absolutely. Yeah. I remember coaching um, quite a senior technical director a number of years ago, and he was just brilliant in his field, you know, an absolutely amazing guy, and he'd helped build this company. <clears throat> but he was hacking off so many people, and, you know, so many people were making complaints against him because he, he was a really poor communicator. And I was brought into. Um, just coach him and, and, and coach a number of other people as well. And, and, and ironically, I was coaching one of the people he had the biggest problem with, which was really interesting to be caught sort of in the middle, but you know, it never compromised what I was doing with either. But this guy just didn't see um, what he was doing wrong. It was sort of like I had to sort of talk him through, you know, so what do you do when people walk in the room for a meeting with you? You know, what do you do? And he said, well, I stand up, I go and greet them, and then I start talking so that I get my point across because I don't want to waste time listening to what they're saying because, you know, I'm, I'm an expert in this field. So, and I was like, okay, well, that's interesting because um, what, would, what would have happened, do you think, if you'd done the same thing to me when, you know, when you'd come to meet me, you know, at reception? 
you know, because you didn't just start talking at me. What did you do? And I asked him to talk it through. And, you know, we, we chatted about the weather. We chatted about my journey there. And, you know, when he offered me a cup of tea and, and all the rest of it. And I said, so that you don't do that with anybody else. That was just for me. And he used to, and honestly, it was just like, you could almost see the light bulb appear on the yeah. top of his head. You know, yeah. it's like, and, and then he said something to me, but I'm not good at small talk. And I said, okay, so what did we talk about on the way from reception to the office? And he said, well, we talked about the weather, your journey here. And, you know, I asked you where you worked most of the time. I said, well, that's small talk. That's, you know, you're showing an interest. We were sort of like getting to know each other. And, you know, I think there are some people who are very, very good at what they do. And, and yet those communication skills are missing. You know, those, you know, they've got to a point where they are very, very, you know, they're experts and they've been promoted to, to a point where people come to them. They are pulled in so many different ways that, you know, they just want to get their stuff out quickly because, you know, that's, that's the people need to hear what they've got to say. And I think you're right. I think communication is just such an important skill to, for people to have. Yeah, it's, it's the one thing as I go through my own um, learning journey and, and continued learning journey, uh, trying to be a mentor, uh, a speaker, and, and trying to inspire people to, to go on their own lifelong learning journey. Um, for me, it always boils down back to communication. You know, we need mm. to step it back. We need to just go, okay, wait a minute. There's, there's three common things we're doing. Like we're all, People don't realize it. We're all following a recipe in life. You know, we're all leaders in life. Uh, your kids will grow up to be just like you. So be the person you want them to be. You know, that's, that's pretty simple. But when I say that we're all following a recipe, good or bad, we follow, we're creatures of habit. And, and if we are not communicating well and we don't step back and see that, we're just going to continue to be, or communicate the way that we always have. Just like your example of the manager who didn't see the bigger picture. And um, until somebody steps in and goes, hey, step back, breathe. Mm. think a bigger picture let somebody yeah. else talk. you know yes I, I, it's funny somebody um i posted on a linkedin comment the other day uh somebody posted a picture of uh, richard branson at a, a raptors basketball game and they were from the organization that uh was sort of sponsoring an event that he was going to be at so that's why they were promoting it and i said now imagine if you were the lucky person who was at the raptors game and you got to sit beside richard branson I said, what question would you ask? So you talk about not good at small talk. Think small talk. Think about it. What question would you ask Richard Branson? And I thought about it for a minute and I thought, you know, there, there's, there's a million business questions he's been asked that I can look up online and get the answer to by somebody who's a much better interviewer than me. And yeah. I, have very, I have very little in common with Richard Branson, to be clear. Yeah. Um, I've never ridden in a hot air balloon. I'm not an adventurist to the degree that he is. Um, just don't have those same life experiences. But I bet you he likes ice cream. So what's your favorite ice cream and why? And when you ask somebody that question, what it does is it takes them back to probably somewhere earlier in their life when they can remember a time when things were easier and all those emotions, those chemicals happening in your brain, you start to relive. Why do I really like chocolate ice cream? Why do I really like soft serve vanilla ice cream? What is it that I really like? And they might tell you that. And all of a sudden, it's not the flavor that you have in common, but it's the shared experience of the emotional experience, that emotional tie you have to one very mm, simple thing. And yeah. that, that becomes, you've now intertwined yourself with a very positive emotion with that person. Mm. And that makes you memorable. Because yes. Yeah, indeed. A mil, a I million, like that one. A million people are going to ask you, what's your one tip to success? Yeah. And, and, but hey, what's your favorite ice cream and why? You know, and then you get into a story. You tell the story about, well, you know, my grandmother first bought me this ice cream at this carnival. I just never had anything that tasted ever, ever like it ever, ever since. And it's just the stories that we tell that we connect to. So um, I think a great tip for anybody who's socially awkward with that small talk, finding something simple that we can all relate to. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just have a simple question that somebody will elaborate with a story and go, hey, I got a similar story. I, I really like soft serve vanilla ice cream and this is why. I, I used to get it at this place. And, 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 and you're, you're, becoming, you're becoming part of that story. You're opening up and it just helps break down some of the barriers. Um, it does. And stories yeah. are so powerful. I once um, went to um, a talk and it was... Um, it's quite a famous person over here in the UK who'd had quite an impact on a particular, um, it's, it's a, an innovation to do with sort of green technology and all sorts of things. And he shared a story about how he got the funding to do this particular thing. And um, 
I was interested because I just thought, well, this sounds really fascinating. And, and he, he talked about um, the fact that he told some future truths. And, and this was his sort of uh, euphemism for he told a few lies about how to get there and what have you. And it made me sort of like question, you know, this story was quite a powerful one because everyone was sort of saying, well, this is amazing, you know, that you did this. And, you know, OK, you took a bit of a punt and you did this. But actually, when we went to, to this place to visit it, it made me really want to find out whether his story was congruent with what he was saying as well. And congruency is a really important thing, because if you say one thing and then somebody sees you behaving in a different way, I mean, my opinion yeah. of this guy sort of plummeted when I talked to his staff, because I said to them, I asked them a few questions, because he'd, he'd proudly talked about other things that he'd done and how he ran the company and blah, blah, blah. And so I asked these guys who were standing around, we had a meal and, and I said, I'm just really keen to talk to you. You know, I met this guy yesterday and I sort of said, you know, he told us about this and, um, and they were sort of going, huh, what? No, never heard of that. And I just think, yeah, it's, it's those stories, but there's got to be a congruency as well. It's sort yeah. of like, cause I've got quite, I've got quite a high opinion of Richard Branson and I'd be really disappointed if I heard some sort of story that, that, that said something to the contrary because he seems like a decent guy and everything. And so, you know, if, if I were to meet him, I think I want to ask some sort of question which would reveal, you know, what's the most important thing that he values, you know, in, you know, in life really or mm. what object he values or something or other, again, for him to... To, to find something sort of deeper, a deeper connection, I suppose, you know, which is similar to your question. And it's funny when you talk about companies and, and, and this individual and, and him telling his company's story, I often um, say to people, it's, it's not our job as companies to tell the company's story. It's our job as HR managers to show our employees how they fit into the company's story and how they can become the hero of their own story. Um, I, I have a great example of uh, in the banking industry, um, there was one of my, my son's uh, friends who we went to university with, who we knew for years and years growing up. Um, he was a, a business economics major and he was mm -hmm. uh, like the right hand man to the student body president. And you thought, OK, this guy's just going to be you know, a lawyer or something fantastic in Toronto. When he's when he's done school, he's, he's off to the races. And, and one day I walked into my local branch of my local credit union and, and there he was at the teller as a teller. And I thought, wow, this is not where I expected you to be. So I said to him, hey, Mazin, what? Like, like, tell me the story. How did you get here? And he said to me, he said, Dave, you know, I really learned when I was in uh, my master's program that I, I love economics so much. And I realized how many people have such a low financial um, IQ out there. And he said, all of my friends have such a low financial IQ. And my job, my, what I want to do, my vision is to help my friends, my peers, not have finance become a stress in their lives. I want them to feel uh, confident and competent when it comes to money. So my, my vision is to help these people increase their financial intelligence. And he said, to do that, I first need to learn how the bank works from the ground up. And at some point, I will be promoted into a position where I can actually help my friends as a financial advisor, but yes. I'm not, I'm not yes. trying to sell them anything. I'm just trying to help them raise their financial IQ. And if they want to buy from me, great. And it's, it's a very soft approach, but, but he's already internalized. Hey, I'm yeah. going to start at the bottom if I want to get to the top. But the, the company's vision, if you look at the, the bank or the credit union, their vision in their mission, in their vision statement, it is to raise the financial IQ of every Canadian citizen. And he yeah. went, oh, that's my vision too. I can now see how the two visions align. And even though yeah. I'm at the bottom, I know I will get to where I want to go eventually if I keep taking another step forward every day to help my friends increase their financial literacy. And it's yeah. not going to happen overnight. It's going to take years. Uh, but but it's, you can see how those two visions align. And absolutely. So, yeah. And it's interesting because just going back to why we started this conversation about finding the story and the data, I think people miss the point that data is also, you find that in the conversations you have and the relationships that you have with people, you know, so he will be gathering data in his, his work as a, as a teller. 
and you know he will see that most people come and they have a, a good solid understanding of dot 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 but lots of people don't understand this so that is data gathering as well and people seem to think that data gathering is is always you know it's got to be through machines or it's got to be in a spreadsheet or whatever you know that data is as valid as the numbers you know that you might crunch in a, a spreadsheet or Oh, that comes, back, that comes back to your qualitative data, right? That's yes, absolutely. Qualitative data, and he should have a good line of communication with his managers to say, hey, this is what we're hearing at the wicket. This yeah. is what people are telling us. This is what they yeah. need. But, yeah. you know, so anyway. Yeah. Christina, thank you very much for um, sharing your time. I, I do have to get going. Yes, um, yes. Well, it's been like, great. But yeah. it has been great. I, I'm, I'm thrilled that we connected on LinkedIn. Um, let's stay connected. I will... Um, post this up in its long format onto a YouTube channel, which I'll share with you as well. Um, I might, uh, I'll, I'll take little snippets out and I'll run that uh, as daily content um, on my, uh, on my uh, LinkedIn daily feed. And I'll, uh, I will uh, at mention you when I do that so that you can uh, interact with the post. Brilliant. Share. Thank you. I do appreciate that. Yeah. Yes. You can share with people through there Absolutely. the links to your book. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'll share back and what have you and have a look at your stuff. But uh, I really appreciate it. And again, apologies for <laughs> forgetting about it, honestly. Nope. But um, no, yeah, it's been it great. It's been, really, it's been really nice to just chat with somebody who sort of thinks in a similar way as yeah. well. And, uh, and I hope we can get that message out to people. You know, I just think, yeah. um, you know, I feel having got the book out, it's going to reach more people. I don't have to just keep, um, you know, in, in small groups whatever telling people about it i'm hoping that the book sends that message out as well you know in a very practical way as yeah, well absolutely well all the continued success and I look thank you to you again okay thank you great okay, to talk now. to you thanks a lot dave yeah thank you